Good evening. Good evening. Am I in the right room? I thought they said I'm meeting Obama leaders. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, everybody. My name is Judy Sakuza, and I will be your moderator today. My day job is to be the Deputy Executive Director at the Mandela Rhodes Foundation. And of course, it's a very big year for us as a foundation, uh, Mandela Centenary. And this past weekend, we've just celebrated 100 Mandela Road Scholars for Mandela Centenary. So seeing young people in front of me engaged, stimulated, is part of my daily work, but really, really looking forward to engaging with you. And of course, our panelists uh, with me here are equally looking forward to it. The topic of this panel is Future Trends in Africa. And this, of course, is a very important discussion to have because you, as emerging leaders, have been selected to really try and solve some of the problems and, I guess, opportunities that we have as a continent. And so we're really fortunate this afternoon to have on the panel uh, thought leaders in areas around technology, entrepreneurship, youth unemployment, uh, leadership development, and uh, health, and really Welcome to the panelists. So with me, we have, of course, I don't think any of them need introduction, but Fred Swanega, who's the CEO of the African Leadership University. Welcome to Fred. We also, then, in the middle there, we have Sangu Dele, who is the Managing Director of Africa Health Holdings. Last but not least, Mariana Iskander. She's the CEO of Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator. So when we talk about future trends in Africa, of course, the issue of population growth is an important one to consider. We all know that by 2035, Africa's population is going to be close to 2 billion. So this raises some crucial questions around how do we think about education? How do we think about health? How do we think about uh, basic service provision? And these are some of the questions that I think you as young leaders will have to consider. We also know that uh, some of the projections, if you look at the current economic growth rate of, on the continent, there's a 4% growth around uh, um, in the next kind of 17 years. If that continues at that rate, what that means is that in terms of absolute uh, rates, poverty, will continue to be a reality on this continent. And in specifically, another 170 million Africans will find themselves in extreme poverty. And what does that mean for you as young leaders in trying to solve for the continent? Economically, we know that um, there will continue to be economic growth on the continent, but there's obviously a variance around which countries will leverage the idea of growth and using the, the markets for uh, leveraging both uh, in, in terms of inter-Africa trade as well as more globally. And then I guess lastly, just to put it out as, as also a question for us to consider in terms of future trends, is this question around integration, right? So we talk about Africa integration. We know that there's been the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement that was recently um, signed in Rwanda. But some analysts are, you know, necessarily not thinking that we're able to really uh, achieve um, integration on the continent. So here, these are just some of the thoughts that we're putting out there. But really, our panelists are the ones who are going to give us more wisdom <laughs> around how they're thinking about future trends on the continent, specifically within your sectors. But of course, we know that these are interrelated issues. And so we'd love to hear a little bit more about how you've been thinking about it and, of course, implications of these for these young leaders. So I'm going to ask Sangu to kick us off. Each of our panelists will have about five minutes of opening remarks. We'll then have a further discussion within us as a panel. And, of course, the people we want to hear from, you in the audience, will open it up for some audience discussion. So thank you, Sangu. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, you know, in the village, the elders say that to know where we are going, we have to understand where we came from and where we are. So I want to start with a quick poll. By show of hands, how many people here believe the world today is getting better? How many people here believe the world today is getting worse? And how many people believe we're kind of in the middle. It's neither getting better nor worse. 
So what's remarkable about the divergence in results is what the late Hans Rosalind called this dramatized worldview. The reality is, in spite of all the problems we have, the world has gotten remarkably better in the last 200 years. In fact, if you look at the trends that has happened in, in, in the last century alone, the number of people that have come out of poverty has been extraordinary. The advancements that have been made have been extraordinary. Today, 75% of global population actually lives in middle-income countries. I, I was at a talk by uh, the former president of Tanzania, Kikwete, and he said something that struck me, because I was, I was lambasting him saying, you know, you're the leaders, you failed us, and look at all these issues. And he said, you know, something you young people forget is when we were looking at the liberation of Tanzania, we had less than 10 engineers. So when you think about it from that perspective, the challenges that we have, it's important, I think, to recognize how far we've come. Now, going forward, it is my thesis that technology is going to create a disruption and a transformation on the African continent that is unprecedented in modern history. And I say this because I took a unique research trip for a book that I wrote that's coming out next year. I went to 45 African countries, and I interviewed over 600 entrepreneurs, some of whom are Obama leaders and in this room today. And what I learned from that six-year journey was that technology and globalization are transforming the landscape for entrepreneurs and for young people in ways that are truly unprecedented. And they're able to scale businesses in a way that simply could not have been possible before. Case in point, you take a fintech company like Flutterwave, that in a short period of time, Flutterwave is now processing over $2 billion in transactions. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, the idea of creating a company that in a short period of time to scale that drastically was unheard of. And you're seeing this among really young entrepreneurs. You're seeing South Africa's own Siabulela, who has a, NASA, I think, is named the minor planet after him. And the advancements he's made in energy independence and fusion energy is incredible. Rwanda's Denise Uineza, who was told that she shouldn't study physics because she's a girl. And she persevered, and she's now one of the top tech entrepreneurs in Rwanda building software for small businesses and doing things that, I mean, 10, 15 years ago were simply unimaginable. And so for me, my big thesis on the future is we are going to see a completely different world because of technology. And of course, my caveat is technology is not, is not the panacea for all our problems. It's going to introduce real problems. What do we do with new inequalities between the digital haves and the digital have-nots? How do we think about privacy concerns? Cambridge Analytica did not just affect the US, it allegedly also interfered in Nigeria's elections. And finally, no amount of technology and no amount of innovation can solve the problem of bad governance. We cannot out-innovate our way out of bad governance. We have to fix the governance challenge. Uh, firstly, I wanted to uh, just say how nice it is to have uh, all of you in, in, our, in, in our academy um, and uh, to thank the Obama Foundation uh, for, for being a part of this. By the way, it, this thing looks like this every day, in case, <laughs> in case you didn't know. You know, and the food you're eating and everything, this is, this is how we live here every day, right? Um, <clears throat> but no, it's really exciting to see, uh, you know, really some of Africa's... Uh, Fantastic um, young leaders here. Um, I understand is is a uh, is Ryan Kugler in the audience? Is he here? No. How many of you have seen the movie Vibranium? I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> Black Panther. Black Panther. You guys seen the movie Black Panther? Yeah. Wakanda, Wakanda forever, right? <clears throat> so um, you know, for me, um, when I think about where we are in Africa today. I think about that movie and um, where they talk about this energy source that we have in Africa, that 
is bringing about all this, um, that, that has led to all this innovation and so forth that we have. And the movie obviously talks about it as, a, as an actual you know, raw material, a mineral that we have. But um, for me, the real vibranium that we have in Africa, I think, is our people. Uh, in particular, our young people, right? Because the rest of the world is aging. The average age of a German or Japanese is 48. The average age of an African is 19.5. So the good thing about young people is that young people are naive enough to imagine better possibilities of doing things. They haven't yet been jaded. They have the energy uh, and the creativity to actually think about you know, really creative solutions to some of our, our biggest challenges. And so this youth bulbs that we talk about in Africa, um, on the one hand, it's a potential crisis for the world, right? Because we have, uh, you know, you mentioned 2035 is when um, we're going to have the largest workforce in the world. So 2035, that's 17 years from now. Seems far away, right? But if you convert that into days, it's only 6,000 days from now. 6,000 days. That's the amount of time that has passed since September 11th. So it's not very long that we have. And so the big opportunity or challenge that we have is, is in, for me in, this, uh, in the next few decades, in 6,000 days, is how do we unlock Africa's uh, talent? How do we unlock this, um, this energy of the one billion people that we have? so that it can, we can really un, um, unlock the creativity and the innovation that we have, not just for Africa, but for the whole world, right? So this for me is, shouldn't be seen as a, as, a, as a problem. It's really an opportunity for the world to find some of the solutions to its big challenges, right? And so the, what I'd like for us to think about today is really um, what it's gonna take um, to unlock this immense talent that, that, that we have. Um, <coughs> And, 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 and for me, it's going to come from two things. One is better leadership, as Sango was talking about, and education, right? Because that's how you, you, you convert what is, has been this raw material into an actual energy source that can start to power development in Africa and ultimately power development in the whole world. I was listening to Fred and thinking, oh my God, we have 6,000 days to figure out <laughs> how to solve really the, the biggest challenge facing the continent, which is whether it's by 2035, the largest workforce, or by 2050, a billion young people who are going to need to be engaged, whether it's in education or in employment. And Judy did a good job of asking us to reflect on, you know, how do we see the moment that we're in? And I was saying, I'm like hugely optimistic and massively impatient because I think that the answer to pretty much all of our problems are young people. Like, they're not the problem, they're the answer. And what we have to do is figure out how to get all the systems around them that are pretty broken at this point out of the way. So whether it's education systems that like undoubtedly we have to work on but are gonna take generations to fix and I think the, the young people that we work with at Arumbi typically are young people who don't get an opportunity to get to tertiary education or didn't, don't get an opportunity to go to university. And so what are the routes to income, to jobs, and to productive engagement that are gonna be available to them um, and many others on the continent? I think the things that have been, I think, hard truths in our work, which is the optimism side, is that you know solving the youth unemployment challenge, I think, in any society is how to make markets grow in a way that brings more people in. It's about how to make education systems respond to what those societies and what those markets need. It's about how to get um, young people to see themselves again as part of the system, being in the system, feeling like there's actually real opportunity to fix their societies, grow their countries, whether it's governance or education or the like. And I think that the, the good news about that is that actually no one sector can solve this problem by themselves. If the private sector didn't need government, they'd just be busy getting it done. If government didn't need the private sector, um, they'd be busy getting it done. But it's at the intersection, I think, of thinking about the role the private sector plays, good government plays, and society plays, that we have seen actually real answers that can be scaled and that can be grown and that again, I think can give us hope while we remain massively impatient about how to move faster. Not every country, but many countries 
have money that they are spending in skills, education, development, it's being spent poorly. We're not getting what we need for that. Can we think about new ways of deploying both public resources and private resources to get to better outcomes? That is challenging some of the norms of the education system, which is what Fred does in his work. It's trying to understand how to say the government money that is there can leverage a lot of the other money that's in the system. So we've uh, one of the things that we're testing is a impact bond to try to say, let's take money governments have, let's try to think about faster, quicker ways to get young people actually into jobs um, and then scale those solutions so that we, again, are creating kind of inclusive growth. I think the last reflection, um, which we can pick up in the discussion, because I'd love to hear from these guys, is I think that a lot of African governments use entrepreneurship as a word when they mean we don't have enough jobs. Yes. Can I get an amen? Yes. So the question of, one, I think it's, you know, it's the time for Africa solutions actually for the rest of the world because all these other countries are waking up and realizing they don't have enough jobs for their people and they're freaking out. We're like, welcome to the party. We've been thinking about this for a really long time and we're ahead of the game on what the answers are. Because the biggest shift and the biggest disruption that I know you're experiencing in your own lives is the straight line from school to work is like not a straight line anymore. Not for you, not for your peers, not for the young people in most of your societies. And the only way that young people are gonna manage, I think, in this fourth industrial revolution that we all have ideas about, is you just, you're gonna have to zigzag around. Like, it's not gonna be a straight line. I get to finish school, I get my internship, I start college, I finish college, I get my first job. And if the criteria for success in the fourth industrial revolution is who can hustle, who can zigzag, who can not expect a straight line, I'm back in Africans all the way. And I think we're gonna have a lot of solutions to be able to offer the rest of the world in thinking about what are these very non-linear, very not straight lines that are gonna be about unleashing our young people to really solve society's problems. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, so you've, you've each raised some crucial themes that I'd like us to explore a bit further. And I guess, Mariana, to you first. This idea of the interplay between the various sectors is crucial because of course I guess one of the things that you as young leaders have to think about is the fact that the sectors are all intersecting in, in ensuring that whatever you're trying to solve isn't just happening in one space. So as someone who's had experience for example in health, in the health sector, how do you look at the interplay between let's say for example health, employment and governance? thing to say. I think the hard work of creating shared accountability, and I would say that, that Harambe's most successful work in building coalitions is like targets everybody owns together. You have to deliver something that nobody again can deliver on their own and how to be able to drive that. The, the example I think with health is that we are learning that there are, there are many economies where young people can do things that are solving society's problems at the same time. So as a small example, we know that in the South African context, the number of, of three to four and five year olds who don't get proper early childhood development because there's not enough either registered ECD providers and you can be a registered day mother or day father as a young person, engaging in play groups, doing work that will, again, solve a societal problem, give you an opportunity to earn a stipend and in many cases be able to use that to progress to something else. So Smart Start is our partner in that space and now thinking about how the care economy is gonna be disrupted by the amount of healthcare that needs to be delivered and there's not enough registered nurses, there's not enough healthcare professionals. How do you think about, again, unleashing the power of young people to do work that benefits societies and actually think creatively about how governments and others can create markets for wages to be able to try to solve all of those problems at the same time. Thank you. Fred, education leadership, this sounds very kumbaya to me. You know, if by 2035, you know, half of the population is going to be under the age of 21, I mean, how do you educate uh, that number of people on the continent? How do you actually get it right? Or are we only talking about a select few elite that we want to put through an education system? Um, so, um, 
uh, we've got um, this 6,000 days, right, to um, unlock Africa's talent. So when I think about that, for me, it's, um, it's not so much about trying to fix the education systems uh, from the very beginning, right? Because that's gonna take too much time, right? We need to be doing work to obviously improve primary school systems and secondary school systems. Well, we've got 6,000 days. So what we need to do is some of the stuff like what Harambe is doing, where they're taking people who are, you know, already able to work, right? Who have been through um, the education systems, systems as good or as bad as they are today. And how do you convert them into productive citizens, right? So um, there are, we, it requires us to think very unconventionally about how you do skills development in the 21st century. To think about um, the fact that um, you, can, you, you, you can use uh, this talent pool that we have um, that maybe doesn't necessarily have all the solid, um, you know, typical education that you might see, but they have other attributes that make them highly valuable um, in, in actually, you know, uh, becoming entrepreneurs or in, or in solving problems, right? So things, traits that we have as Africans, like uh, your hunger, right? Your passion, you know, your, your, your drive, um, your imagination. These are things that you're not necessarily going to be taught in school, right? And so it, it means finding different ways of assessing talent in people, right? So that you can find ways to unlock that talent. It means employers thinking differently about um, the, the potential of, of, of people, right? And, and, and finding someone who maybe didn't, you know, has only got primary school education, but taking them through development. Now, I'll, I'll tell an example, you know, um, there's a young man who uh, I met in 2007 when we were selecting the first class for the African Leadership Academy. And uh, this guy had been, he was a young man from Malawi, and he had been, uh, he had dropped out of school when he was 14 because his family couldn't afford to pay fees for him. And so he was sitting at home for six years and um, decided during that time that he would go to the library and he saw a picture of a windmill in a textbook. And from that, he figured out how to build a windmill and managed to generate electricity from this thing, right? But no one knew about him. He just sat undiscovered. And then we met him in 2007. And at the time, he was 19 years old. But he couldn't speak English, right? It was at a TED conference that I met him. And, and, and we were selecting the first class for this academy. So I was like, well, you know, we can't really select this guy. He doesn't have the academic preparation. He's not going to be able to do the work, right? But then I thought about it. I said, you know what? This academy that we're building, we're looking for exceptional people, people who have what it takes to, 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 to succeed despite all odds. So let's give this guy a chance, right? And we tested him and we found out that even though he was 19 years old, academically he was only in fourth grade, right? But we brought him into this academy and within two years, we were able to catch him up. And he graduated and went to an Ivy League university in the US, right? <laughs> He went to Dartmouth University, he studied engineering, he graduated in four years. It's a typical US college graduates don't finish in four years. He published a book, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, that became a bestseller on Amazon.com, you know. And he's now been able to um, generate, you know, so much funding from his book that he's built a school in his uh, village in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Malawi, he's educating 500 kids. And he's now powering the entire village of 60 homes with the energy that he's working. So this is what we have in Africa. And it says, take an unconventional look at the talent, right? And don't write people off just because they haven't finished school. And so we have a lot of people like this, millions of people. Like that. So that's why what we're doing with the African Leadership Group is saying, we're going to find millions of these people, right? We started here with this academy. And now we're opening universities around Africa. And our goal is to unlock the talent of three million of these people. I don't care what your schooling is. If you've got these traits, 
then we can find ways to unlock your talent and make you productive as entrepreneurs and as leaders, and we can then power Africa's economy that way. And that's what we have to do. Brilliant. So I'm hearing this idea of how do we take what we have as a continent and actually particularly in the kind of, um, you know, VUCA world that we live in, we, we can't just look at the conventional ways of education and taking people through a system um, and how do we leverage the resilience that is inherent within the journeys that people have gone through. Okay, I think I can buy that. Sangu. Now, you're talking about this industrial revolution for technologies the way. My brother, people can say, listen, Africa is not even out of industrial revolution one. Now you're talking about industrial revolution four and technology is the future. Yep. Tell me, tell me, how do, you, how do we actually see the continent leveraging technology? So here's why I think we cannot, I mean, look, the classic example we point out to is the mobile phone. Right, we leapfrogged in that example. And at the time uh, when Mo Ibrahim was doing Celtel, everyone thought he was crazy, so much so that some countries gave him licenses for free. It was very contrarian. It, you know, no one thought it could be successful. Now, it's, it's important for us to realize that the status quo isn't going to work for a number of reasons. First of all, 11 million young people enter the workforce every year to meet 3.7 million formal jobs. This is not even factoring in the demographic changes where we're going to have a billion people born. Secondly, we are catastrophically unprepared for the future. We're moving into our current status quo, which is built on industry and normal work. We're not even fulfilling. And now we're moving into a world of automation, where the jobs are going away. We're moving into a, robo you know, a world of robots. When you know, the UAE has a Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence. You want us to sit here and still be talking about the old world, then how will we catch up? And so that there's a way in which, yes, there are real challenges, there are real problems. There are clean water issues, there are, you know, uh, infant mortality issues. But if we're, if, we, if we're going to imagine a world, a future of Africa, where one day, our grandkids can sit on our laps and tell us, grandma, grandpa, you mean Africa used to be poor? If that's the future we want to build, we cannot afford to take these baby steps of saying, let's just solve these basics. We have to leapfrog. We have to figure out, you know, David Senge, who's one of the uh, leaders here, when he was doing work in artificial intelligence on healthcare, realized that, if we look at our healthcare situation today, we're 14% of global population, 26% of global disease burden, and we only have 3% of global healthcare workers. Do you know how long it'll take to train the doctors to, solve, to, to bridge that gap? We'll, we'll wait for 300 years before we'll have enough doctors to go through school, and we can't afford, we, how, how many kids are going to die before we get to that point? And so, you know, David Senge's project was looking at how do we use artificial intelligence in healthcare? How do we figure out ways in which we can use machine learning where places where there are in doctors, we can use AI to deliver healthcare. And that's the sort of thinking we need to catalyze us from this growth because the status quo is not going to work. So, I mean, I can agree with you, absolutely. So how do you advise these, these future leaders who have to balance out the idea of actually providing employment to people while also pushing for technological advancement? Because I think that's, that's the paradox, right, that the leaders of today and tomorrow have to deal with. How do you deal with the fact that we've got high unemployment rates, that the population growth is going to continue to, 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 to demand that we provide more jobs? How do you help someone who's worried that mm -hmm. the technology is going to steal my job? Oh, in fact, there is not even yep. enough jobs already. See it as an opportunity. It ties to what Fred said mm -hmm. about there is something about that African hunger and, and, and taking an, a different perspective on how you view talent. Look, I look at one of our portfolio companies, Andela. And Andela has proven that, I mean, we have software developers from Andela sitting in Nairobi and sitting in Lagos who are working alongside engineers in, at Microsoft and Google and all these global firms, and they're working at that level, right? And so that becomes a unique opportunity because if you had to go to a traditional school and do a computer science degree or do all of that, I mean, you, you spend a long time in school. 
But you go through this program, and in a very short period of time, suddenly you're equipped with skills. And because of those innate things and you know, the model tests for, you're now put in a position where you're actually able to compete at a global level. You're earning six figures. The jo- this is not brain drain. You are sitting in the continent. And then, importantly, you're building this ecosystem of developers. They are now committed to creating 100,000 developers. What does that now mean if we have 100,000 developers? Which would be 20x what we have today. What does that mean for the creation of new industries and new companies? So for me, my challenge is every, because of the, oppor- the opportunity 20 years ago, the problem 20 years ago was a lot of technologies didn't exist. But today, we've been, there's been a paradigm shift where your ability to create businesses leveraging technology reduces your cost substantially. So every problem we have is an opportunity for you to create a technology-enabled business that will make money, that will create jobs, and that will help build this technology ecosystem so we don't perpetually keep keep being left behind. So it's seeing technology as a tool that assists us and not a threat. Exactly. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to ask... I think the... Can you hear me? Um, It's important that we look at technology as a means to an end and not an end in itself, Mm. right? So, um, you know, how many of you guys are excited? Are talk, everyone's talking about blockchain and Bitcoin, right? And, you know, but no one knows exactly what this thing is, right? <laughs> and um, it's very easy to get excited about these, you know, technologies for technology's sake. And the way I look at it is that the real businesses that are going to be built in Africa and the uh, pain points that are going to be solved for people in Africa are going to come by looking at the worst problems that we have in Africa, right? So, you know, I think about what I call the seven grand challenges of Africa, right? These are big, big problems that if we don't solve them, we are really in difficult a difficult place. So these are big issues like urbanization, right? There are 800 million people who are going to move into cities in the next 40 years, right? So that is a huge potential problem, right? Healthcare is another big challenge. Education, infrastructure, governance, youth unemployment, this issue of the you know, the one billion jobs that we need. Climate change. Um, And so what you need to do, in my opinion, is to look at these challenges and then say, okay, big businesses are built. Innovation comes around when you're trying to solve problems, not just because you're trying to be rich or just because you have some technology you're trying to find an application for, right? So if you think about urbanization, for for one, when you start to think about what is going to happen as 800 million people move into cities in Africa, then you realize, geez, what are we going to do about sanitation? What are we going to do about uh, transportation? What are we going to do about low-cost housing? Right? And so now, you must be the one to figure to become the billionaire garbage collector. Because now, that's a business opportunity, but it's a very simple business. It's the business that are going to be built in Africa, some of them are not very sexy. Right? It's the hard stuff that needs to be done. Right? If you think about the fact that 800 million people are moving to cities in Africa, and Nigeria, for example, has a backlog of 20 million homes, and they're only building 150,000 a year, then it's about saying, okay, wow, how do I use technology to figure out ways to do low-cost housing? Maybe I'm 3D printing my, the homes, right? <laughs> Using some composite material that no one has done before, and that's where you're leapfrogging. And so you have to start by understanding the fundamental problems of African people. Because people will pay you for solving their problems, not just because you have some sexy technology. And, 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 and that's really how you, uh, you, know, uh, you need to think about it. Fantastic. Let's open it up. All right, so I see we've got a hand over there. Are we able to get a mic there? Fantastic, so there's a hand here, a hand here, a hand here, hand here. And let's, let's, let's hold those four and then we'll take another round. Thank you. Hi, my name is Serenzi Lenkambule. I am a media practitioner from South Africa. Thanks for that presentation. Fred, to you, whenever we speak about trends, we never, never really talk about the so-called softer issues, right? So how do we ensure that we are building a, um, just, just more decent human beings? Mm. So here you have a, an AI genius, but who's misogynistic, homophobic. Mm. It's, it's just a prick, mm. but he's amazing. Mm. Those kind of people are just as dangerous mm to our society and our future as the, you know, the grandpas who refuse to vacate office. Mm. So we'll take, we'll take a round and then we'll, we'll answer the questions. Thank you for that. 
Yes, I'd, I'd noted a hand here. Yes, thank you. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Candice, and I'm from Cameroon. Uh, my question is for Fred. I wanted to know how did the transition between uh, your corporate life to this amazing project look like in terms of, yeah, basically being impact-driven in identifying a problem and then tra transitioning financially in terms of building a team, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yara Beatty and I'm from Egypt. Uh, my, my question is for Sangu. Uh, you're speaking about the future trends and challenges. Um, I get comments like you're not African enough, we don't consider you African. It's not in this context, but in other contexts. So how do you think we'll be speaking about the challenges and the future trends when we're still judging each other? We are not looking to a cooperation, we are looking more into how we define each other, which I find um, a little bit challenging when we're thinking about the future. Hi, uh, my question is uh, for Fred as well. Uh, so my name is Pedro Lopes, I'm from Cabo Verde Islands, uh, a country that Fred knows uh, very well. Um, and I'm Secretary of State for Innovation and Vocational Training, Technical Training. So everyone asks me about innovation, no one asks me about technical training. And that's a challenge for, for us uh, because we want to create jobs for, for our young people. So technical training is important uh, for the ones that are out of the system of the university system. But my question is, how can I um, prepare these young people for the demand of the, the market right now that normally is the tourism sector because we are a touristical uh, country and at the same time prepare them to surf their surfboard to surf the, the, um, the wave of innovation for the future because I don't want to solve their problem right now I want to solve the problem for, for them for in 10 years. So that's my question because I have a budget and I always, I always I have this challenge where I'm gonna put the money. I'm gonna just uh, help them to find a job right now, but then in 10 years, they might not find one. So how can we prepare our, our generations, generations for the future, but at the same time, give them a job now today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fred, three were directed to you, Sangu, and I think, Maureen, you can also I respond to, 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 to that first one. All right, thank you. Uh, sure, so um, thanks for those questions. Um, to um, the question uh, about how do you create someone who's just a good human being? Um, and that's an excellent, excellent question. And one of the things that uh, we think about, you know, at least in, when we are educating people here at the African Asian Academy and the African Asian University is, um, education should not only be about facts and figures, right? Um, education, education institutions, are, at the end of the day, are creating the next generation of leaders, the next generation of citizens, right? And therefore, values and character should be as fundamental part of the education system as much as the facts and figures and the, and the so-called standard curriculum that people think about, right? So, you know, it's very important that, um, you know, organize, education institutions see that that is their role as well. And so one of the things we do here at ALA and at AOU is really um, everyone, all our facilitators, don't see themselves as just teachers. They understand that it's their role to, in, 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 you know, infuse good values into the people that they're developing. Uh, and to ensure that people are living with good moral character. So that, especially as we're going to the world of artificial intelligence and automation and so forth, we should not lose our soul as human beings, right? Someone has to write the algorithms that are gonna determine what happens in the world. And if people are going and they're writing those algorithms who are racist, who are you know, misogynist and all of these things, imagine what gets coded into our future, right? So it's very important that um, education institutions of the future realize that especially when machines are taking over the world, people who are going to be intelligent in the future are going to be those who are actually more human. Because that's actually the only way you're going to compete against the machines when you actually think about how do you do things that human beings can't do, like have empathy and, 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 and humility and all those kind of things. So values is a very, very important part of education. 
um, if it's good education. So um, just to challenge you briefly on that, but how do you work practically at changing people's mindsets? Because of course, people will say things like, it's, Afri it's un-African to be gay right, as a value system. So how do you actually then work with someone like that who's been identified as a leader and is out there making decisions and, and influencing policy? How do you work at that level of getting them to, to really challenge that worldview that they well, have? The, the nice thing about young people is that they're malleable, right? They're, 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 they're not yet set in stone. So for example, some of the things we do here at the African Leadership Academy is, you know, firstly, we have students from all across Africa, right? North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, everyone is here. So you see people of difference. We make sure that if you're Muslim, you're put in a room with a Christian, and you live for two years with someone who's different from you. We make sure you don't live in a room with someone from your same country, right? And you celebrate all of the different cultures that we have on campus. So you start to see that you actually have a lot more in common than you have difference, right? So there, there are practical ways in which you can do this. What, or also, you don't just reward people for, for performing on academic exams. You reward them for demonstrating and exhibiting good values, right? And so start, people soon start to realize, actually, this is how I need to show up as a human being. And, and, and you, you, you change that in that way. Um, just to quickly touch on the other questions. Um, there was um, this question about transitioning from the corporate world to um, being a, a social entrepreneur. <laughs> that wasn't easy. Um, you know, so when I, uh, um, I, I started my career initially after college working for McKinsey, um, and uh, I remember uh, my mother was very happy when I got my job at McKinsey because she could tell her friends, oh, yeah, my son flies business class, <laughs> you know. And I go to Stanford, and uh, I get, I do my MBA, and um, I decide now that I'm going to go and start a school, right. And so my mother didn't talk to me for about a year and a half. She got all my relatives to call me and tell me I was just doing, you know, I was just being irresponsible and so forth. The other issue was that McKinsey had sponsored my MBA. And so um, if I didn't go back to them, I had to pay them $120,000, right? So for two years, I had no salary um, because the, the little money I had raised, I used it to pay McKinsey, right? And so what I did was I made sure that I had, a, I scheduled three meetings a day. I had a breakfast meeting, a lunch meeting, and a dinner meeting, right? And, uh, you know, the people who took me out would be like, well, you know, when the bill, time came, time came to pay the bill, I would reach like I was, I was pretending to pay. <laughs> and then they were like, no, I'll take it. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> like, okay, fine, fine, fine. Right? <laughs> so, um, you know, those are some of the, the, the early struggles, right? Um, there was a time when I was in New York and I took a train across the river to, to New Jersey to raise some money, and I didn't have money uh, at the end to, to go back. I had no bus train fare, right? And I remember looking in the, in the skyscrapers on the other side of New York and seeing my friends working in those skyscrapers and making hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> but I can tell you that those moments were also the moments where I've been most fulfilled in my life, right? Because nothing beats working for something that is a higher purpose than yourself, right? And that is worth more than any money in the world. And I think that my challenge to all of you in this audience is to work for something bigger than yourself. <coughs> because you are privileged. The fact that you are in this room, the fact that you've lived to the age that you have lived to, the education you've had, that you're in good health, puts you in the top 1% of the 1% of the 1% of Africa. So the only way you can justify this privilege is by serving others. And as uncomfortable as it will be in those early days, when you're going through all those hard moments of trying to make it and leaving that corporate job, if you don't do it, then who will? And that's really what is at stake here. It's a, it's a, you know, our, the, the, the future of our continent is at stake. And you are being looked at as the leaders who can, you know, really transform Africa. And so we have to do it, no matter how difficult it's going to be. And eventually you get it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, really it's about not giving up, perseverance, just keeping going, and, uh, you know, next thing you know, in, if 
20, 15 years later, we've raised 200 million US dollars. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, it, it eventually gets sorted out. The last question about um, training, technical training, how do you keep it relevant? Um, the only thing I'll say is that um, uh, I really believe that education um, in today's world should be seen as the purpose of education. One of the things is, yes, you need to prepare uh, people for immediate skills that they need to be productive today. But the second thing you really need to do is to teach people how to learn, right? Learning how to learn should be the really fundamental part of the education model so that as the world changes and as they need to keep reinventing themselves, they're able to continue to learn new things. So, it's, so that's, you know, and there are ways to, to teach, and I can chat with you afterwards, but really it's about saying you shouldn't be just thinking about education as a one-shot game. It has to become lifelong learning where you are constantly able to reinvent yourself as the world changes. Thank you, friend. And you remind me of really the story about being courageous in stepping out. Um, I was working for an investment bank when I decided that I wanted to do something more meaningful. My mother said, Intoni, upambe, which is, are you, have you lost your mind? Mm. And it's hard because you're living the dream, you've got the penthouse, you've got, you know, the view of Joburg, etc. Hey, I, I, no, no, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's, it's, it's crucial because I think also when your family gets to see uh, years later where you are, um, and I think especially for us as African children, there is that pressure for us to provide, and we mustn't take that for granted. And it's something that, especially coming out as being the first person in your family to get a degree, there is that real pressure, and it's not to take it for granted. But how do we have that conviction of courage to know that there's a bigger sense of purpose that you're going out for? And I think one of the best stories I, I'm able to tell is uh, I think a few years after I left my corporate job, I then came back to my mother, who at the time was living at the back of someone's house in a shanty house. And I came to her and I said, come here. She said, what's happening? And I had a key in my hand. And she said, what is this? And I took her and we walked a little bit further down the street. And I said, here's a key for your house from the BA bugger roll. You know, and, uh, and, and she really in that moment was able to see that we're able to go out and do what we, you know, what we value, but at the same time not compromise our values. Sengu, so a question about how do we define ourselves, not particularly in this context, but this idea of there is a distinction that people make about sub-Saharan Africa yeah. and the rest, and how do you, you know, help us think through that, particularly as we think about building for the future? Definitely. Um, um, before that, I just want to quickly say, it's funny, as Fred was saying this, I, I could relate very much on so many levels. First of all, I disappointed. I think my father was heartbroken when I told him I wasn't doing medicine. And I had an uncle. I decided to, I studied, my first degree at Harvard was in African studies. And my uncle was so furious, and he told me that there are four options for an African. Lawyer, doctor, engineer, and loser. <laughs> <laughs> And then he said, you left Africa to get scholarship to go to Harvard, to study Africa. <laughs> like, he was. Till today, he's, he cannot understand for the life of him what is, you know, what's happening with me. But uh, God has been good. <laughs> um, I want to respond to that, but there's, uh, um, I also wanted to quickly, the, 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 someone gave me a gift recently, which was a T-shirt that I love. And the T-shirt had an emblem on it that said, uh, the future is female and African. Right? And I loved it because tying back to what you said earlier about technology is a future of technology, even though when we say technology, we immediately think of some man in glasses. That's not what I'm talking about, right? It also means that we need our science fiction writers to imagine that future for us. We need the philosophers, so we govern these things. People, you know, it, it requires, as Fred mentioned, people who are going to help us think about all the different spheres of life and humanity. So if anything, I think that a, a life of AI and machine learning, more so than ever, calls for um, the cultural guardians of our society. Um, on diversity, um, I am I, I'm an African mutt. I'm a product of 
My grandparents come from Ghana, Burkina Faso, and Egypt. My grandmother is Egyptian, <laughs> right? Um, and so, and, and I think that it's important for us to realize that what we call Ghana and Nigeria and Egypt are arbitrary boundaries, right? When that you know, conference in 1884 was being had, we were not there. No one like that looked like These were just random lines drawn. And if you look at pre-colonial Africa and even where the trade routes were, there was so much incredible intermixing and trade routes that spanned from West Africa all the way to North, all the way to East, all the way down to the South. And I, I very, very, very passionately believe in Pan-Africanism. And I believe in Pan-Africanism. And, it's, it's, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. I believe in Pan-Africanism because I really think that is how we're going to make it in the world. When, when Ghana became independent, the, the first in Sub-Saharan Africa, our first president, Kwame Nkrumah, said on, our independent, on, on 1957, 6 March, Ghana's independence is meaningless unless it is linked with the total liberation of the African continent. We are not free in Ghana if someone is not free in Benin, if someone is not free in Congo. We saw what happened with the Ebola crisis. If you are sitting somewhere in one country and you think you have good health care and your neighbor has bad health care, you get affected. And when we think of ourselves in a Pan-African context as one unified market, we're a billion consumers. And then we can rival China. And then we can rival India. And then we can step up. Tall, and we can be Wakanda. <laughs> but we're not doing it, right? 12% of trade is only happening intercontinentally. So what True. is stopping us? We can sit here, right, and say we're Wakanda, but why are we not doing it now? So why is it that we're so not So we're trading? not doing it. There, 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 there is some progress. There's the free trade agreement, which a lot of countries have signed. Um, you know, Nigeria, we're waiting on Nigeria to sign it. Buhari has indicated he will. Um, and so th there is that progress. There's progress on the regional level, right? Whether it's your ECOWAS or your SADC, th th there has been that movement. Look, for, I remember when I did my trip, I was very, very angry traveling to 45 African countries because for the majority of them, I needed visas. It is easier, to, it was easier to travel with a European passport on my own continent than to travel with an African passport. But that's changing. Rwanda announced no African passport needs a visa. Ghana recently announced it. That's changing. And I also think what's changing is our generation. We no longer think in those silos because we can't afford to. If you interview anyone here, I guarantee you they have friends from across many different African countries. And so that's the other beauty also that I think technology has afforded us is we're able to create our own communities. And if, if, if the old gods, if the, uh, what the, the, the elephants um, want to think in, in those boundaries, we reject those boundaries and we will compete and we will collaborate on a Pan-African basis. Egyptian, I agree that identity is complicated and I just feel like the idea of understanding how the continent is interconnected and we see that even in our work now, how South African businesses were setting up in Rwanda as well and opportunities that we can see to drive linkages that may not be there or need to be created. Just because everybody told a story about their parents, can I just say one thing? <laughs> because these questions of, of the the how you manage the opportunity and exposure you've been given. So my parents thought that the Rhodes Scholarship was a construction thing, <laughs> right? And then I had to explain that it wasn't and that it was gonna work out and that eventually it did. Because, because the question of really getting the most talented minds working on the hardest problems, that's why it's not so much a trade-off of time in corporate. You must go learn wherever you need to learn. But I think at the end of the day, the intractable problems are the ones that need you. The problems that actually nobody has an easy answer for are the ones that need you. And I hope that some of what you get from all of these stories is that, that working together on the hardest problems is actually, I think, the real opportunity for the continent. 
I just wanted one, one observation. I thought your question on sort of what's the human capacity needed in a world of automation. So at Harambe, we see roughly 10,000 young people a month in our South Africa centers. We work with about 450 private sector employers. And I don't think it's a, like the machines are gonna take over tomorrow. How are we seeing automation and employers struggling with automation? Is actually, as the, as the machines do the more rudimentary repeat tasks, the skills most needed are the human skills. Not just in writing algorithms and writing code, but like engaging it with empathy with somebody else. Like the higher order skills are actually the ones that are gonna be more required as the tasks that don't require humans necessarily because they can be automated or they're repeat or whatever it is. And so what we're seeing in, in most sectors is employers are struggling because they're also trying to figure out how to answer for this. But actually the, the, the deeply formed human is what the workforces are gonna need more and more of as the work that doesn't require those same empathy and resilience and all of the things that Fred talked about are gonna be in more demand. That's how we're seeing automation. Fantastic. So time is running out, but we can't talk about future trends without touching a little bit on climate change. So who would like to just give us uh, thoughts and perspectives around that in a minute? Happy to talk about climate change. Um, I, and and I, I'll, I'll confess, um, growing up, um, I wasn't the biggest believer in climate change in that I thought it was this tree-hugging thing that these um, white people are coming and we have other big problems. We're trying to solve hunger and trying to solve these other issues and they're coming here telling us the trees are dying. Right? That was my perspective, I'm being honest. Um, and what changed my life and what made me a very passionate climate change activist was when I actually started to travel across the continent and even within Ghana. And that's the other thing also that um, I would encourage all of you to do. With great humility, check yourself. Before you get up and speak for Africa, or for, make sure you've actually gone and seen, right? Because I remember those times I knew Accra. I didn't really know Africa and speaking for Africa and saying climate change is not our problem. And then I would travel around to these villages and I would meet families who had been fishing for a long time, and they would talk about how the fishes have been depleted, or where livelihoods are being threatened because you're seeing illegal mining seep into the water, and suddenly they're having very serious problems with the crops and with water, or, or the marine life is, is, is a huge disaster because of uh, the plastic in our oceans, where even you will find some of the fish you cut them open and there's these nanoplastics and microplastics that are in them. The shifts in, in, in rain, in, you know, the, the rainfall patterns are changing and that's affecting um, uh, farmers. And, and so as I was traveling into the hinterlands and, and, the, and the fishing villages and I was meeting people and understanding how their lives have been adversely impacted by climate change, it completely changed my perspective. And I realized that my God, on the continent, we are, we are by far, we are not the biggest contributors to climate change, far from it, but we suffer the most, right? And so it's something that if, if, if we go to that original vision I tried to paint of, the future I see it as that future where we can have our grandkids on our laps and they'll look us in the eyes and say, Africa used to be poor. We cannot build that future if there is no earth to talk about. We cannot build that future if we don't have the, you know, the trees and we don't have the climate and we don't have all these issues. And so it's, it's, it's something that um, I've, I've come to realize very deeply that we cannot have an African future if we do not take care of our world. So I'm going to take, there was, I need two more hands and it has to be 30 seconds each because we are running out of, th we had a hand here and you, sir, thank you. Very briefly, to the point. Um, hi everyone, Andrew Gasnola from South Africa. It's a quick question for Zengu. Uh, just in the disruption space and governance, what sort of disruptive tools do you think young people can rely on besides social media, that's the obvious one, um, that they can use to improve governance? Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Innocent Magambi. I'm from Burundi. My question goes to Fred. Do you think that the current education system is for us Africans? Do we need to get to the point where we can change tables as Grace Marshall told us today? Great, thank you. So panelists, what I'm gonna ask you to do is in responding, also in a way try and give closing remarks, a minute each a maximum and Mariana will hear from you too. Um, yeah, so to your question about um, uh, do I think the education system that we have today is ideal? No. Um, you know, I think that Africa needs to completely reimagine how we do things, right? Including education, including healthcare, including because we don't have a lot of time. So we need to bring radical thinking and unconventional solutions and not just continue doing the status quo, right? So that applies to education and it means, you know, thinking about how do you educate people when you don't have teachers, right? How do you uh, educate people and how do you finance education when you don't have a lot of money? Right? And so lots of radical thinking that is needed and um, happy to chat with you afterwards just to share with you some of the, the things that, are, you know, that, 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 that people are doing in that, in that space. But uh, short answer is no. You need to develop people who are more attuned to solving African problems, who can think uh, about you know, unconventional ways and, and, and allow us to really um, create a solution for, for our specific uh, purpose. And just as a closing thought for me, I, you know, I, the, just the, the question about sort of you know, how do you, that you raised about how do you uh, enhance Pan-African cooperation and trade and everything. I think that a program like this one that, you know, the Obama Foundation is doing is, an exa is, a, is, a, is another example of how we, we can overcome that. Because when Africans get to know each other, right, and you form relationships with each other, that is how, because trade doesn't happen, you know, because the World Bank says it should happen. Trade happens because human beings have relationships with each other and because they, 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 they understand each other, they see the possibilities and opportunities in each other's country. So, you know, I really encourage all of you to use this opportunity as a fantastic platform to get to know each other so that you are driving the Pan-African trade and investment and collaboration that we need. Thank you. Um, it's a very good question on uh, the role of technology and governance. I think, to me, look, the reality is Social media is an obvious one, but social media is just a minority. We have 388 million Africans online. That's a 31% 30, penetration rate, which means 69% are offline, right? So there's still huge opportunities offline, SMS-based. How can we think about even something as simple as digitization? You go to some of the ministries, right, and there is no real sense of institutional memory. There's no real sense of how do we think about what policies have worked and what hasn't worked, right? So th th there's, there's low-hanging fruit in ways in which we can just take um, uh, natural language processing, mapping. There's so many things that we can do to really enhance governance. Transparency. How do we ensure that we take, uh, we use these tools to make sure that the voters and the public are aware of what's going on? That they are, how do we break down, there's, a, there's an incredible nonprofit in Nigeria called Budget, and they break down the budget in a way that's amazing, where they'll tell you in each state, in each local area, this is the budget that's been allocated, and they give you the tools to then question your lawmakers. So I think there are lots of ways in which um, we can leverage technology in that way. My um, closing remark, um, when I was in the middle of my JD MBA program, I had a dream in which I died. And I woke up from the dream in sweats. And I, I, I remember I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. I was terrified. But that dream changed my life. It changed my life because I realized, I started asking myself the question of what if? What if I had died? What does my life mean? What does today mean? And, and it forced me to realize that too often, we live our lives in a way where we were planning for this future of, I, you know, the, the, the life we want to live, we almost put it off for the future. And that day, I decided I'm going to live that life now because I don't want to ever wake up and I'm gone and I'll think I lived a life I didn't really want to live. So my message to you is, one, 
Go live that life you want to live today so that every single day counts. And two, be a beacon of hope in your communities. Because I think that, you know, a lot of times people sometimes will um, dismiss the value of hope. But hope is powerful. Hope is what gets us in spite of the obstacles, in spite of things that tell us that there can be a better tomorrow. Hope is what makes us believe that we can do it. And when we look at 6,000 days, we can do it alone. But we need to go and be beacons of hope so we can be catalysts, so that we can create change makers everywhere else, so that together, by day 6,000, we can create that future that our grandkids can sit on our laps and they can tell us that the Africa we grew up learning and all those tropes is a vestige of the past. Thank you. So I'll, just, I'll, I'll close by leaving you with day five, which is Friday and the end of your time here together. And I think that the hardest and most important thing that I've discovered in these kinds of settings is how to be vulnerable with each other and use this as an opportunity um, to either do something that scares you, say something that scares you, build the relationships with each other. Because I think Fred's observation is exactly right, is things happen because people know people. And I think you know, you've got the next five days to suit up and help us think about the 6,000, I think, to come. And so I just encourage you to really take advantage of that opportunity with each other and, and put yourself out there and be vulnerable with each other. Well, the time was not enough, of course, because I think we've only started to touch the surface of this important conversation. But panelists, thank you so much for bringing your insights you. and your wisdom. And I really want to echo their sentiments. You know, as someone who's worked now for five years with young leaders similar like you who are passionate about this continent, these relationships you make this week are actually going to define a lot of what you get to do in the future. And so don't take every interaction that you have for granted because we had our reunion um, this weekend where Mandela Road scholars who had met each other 10 years ago were sharing stories about how they've uh, had cross collaborations. A scholar in Nigeria has built something with a scholar in Rwanda. And that's how um, we actually begin to make change on this continent. So we're looking forward to engaging with you now afterwards. And of course, the conversation continues. Thank you very much.